Chapter Twelve of Memoirs of Madame Vigée Le Bon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigée Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigée Le Bon, translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter Twelve moscow no more dreadful fatigue can be imagined than that which awaited me in the journey from st petersburg to moscow the roads i counted upon as being frozen as i had been led to believe were not yet in that condition the roads in fact were terrible the logs which rendered them almost impracticable in severe weather not being as yet fixed by the frost rolled incessantly under the wheels and produced the same effect as waves of the sea my carriage was half covered with mud and gave us such terrible shocks that at every moment i expected to give up the ghost for the sake of some relief from this torture i stopped halfway at the inn of novgorod the only one on the route where so i had been informed i should be well fed and lodged being greatly in want of rest and faint with hunger i asked for a room hardly was i installed when i noticed a pestilential smell that made me sick the master of the inn whom i begged to change my room had no other to give me and i therefore resigned myself but soon seeming to observe that the intolerable stench came from a glazed door in the room i called for a waiter and questioned him as to the door oh he calmly replied there has been a dead man behind that door since yesterday that is probably what you smell i waited for no further particulars got up had my horses harnessed and started taking nothing with me but a piece of bread to continue my journey to moscow i had accomplished but half of the journey whose second part was to be more fatiguing than the first not that there were any high hills but the road consisted of perpetual ups and downs which i called torture the climax to my annoyance was that i could not amuse myself with a view of the country through which i was travelling since a thick fog veiled the scene on all sides and this always depresses me if one considers besides these tribulations the diet i was restricted to after i had eaten my piece of bread it will readily be conceived that i must have found the road very long at length i arrived in the former immense capital of russia i seemed to be entering ispahan of which place i had seen several drawings so much does the aspect of moscow differ from everything else in europe nor will i attempt to describe the effect of those thousands of gilded cupolas surmounted with huge gold crosses those broad streets those superb palaces for the most part situated so far asunder that villages intervened to obtain a right idea of moscow you must see it i was driven to the mansion which m dimidoff had been kind enough to lend me this enormous building had in front of it a large courtyard surrounded by very high railings it was untenanted and i promised myself perfect peace after all my fatigue and my forced diet my first concern as soon as i had appeased my hunger was of course to sleep but bad luck to it at five o'clock in the morning i was awakened with a start by an infernal din a large troop of those russian musicians who only blow one note each on their horns had established themselves in the room next to mine to practice perhaps the room was very spacious and the only one suitable for this kind of rehearsal i was careful to inquire of the porter if this music was played every day upon his answer that the palace being uninhabited the largest apartment had been devoted to this purpose i resolved to make no change in the customs of a house that was not my own and to look for another lodging in one of my first expeditions i called on the countess stroganov the wife of my good old friend i found her hoisted on top of some very high affair which did nothing but rock to and fro I could not imagine how she could endure this perpetual motion, but she wanted it for her health, 
as she was unable to walk but this did not prevent her being agreeable to me i spoke to her of the embarrassment i was in on account of lodgings she at once told me she had a pretty house that was not occupied and begged me to accept it but because she would hear nothing of my paying a rent i positively declined the offer seeing that her efforts were in vain she sent for her daughter who was very pretty and asked me to paint this young person's portrait in payment of rent to which i agreed with pleasure thus a few days later i settled in a house where i hoped to find quiet since i was to live there alone as soon as I was established in my new dwelling, I visited the town as often as the rigors of the season would permit. For during the five months I spent in Moscow, the snow never melted. It deprived me of the pleasure of seeing the environments said to be admirable. Moscow is at least ten miles round. The Moskva cuts through the town and is joined by two other small streams, and it is really an astonishing sight, all those palaces, those finely sculptured public monuments, those convents, those churches, all intermingled with pretty landscapes and villages. This mixture of urban magnificence and rural simplicity produces an extraordinary fantastic effect, which must please the traveller who is in search of something new. The churches are so numerous in this city that a popular saying runs, Moscow, with its forty times forty churches moscow is supposed to contain four hundred twenty thousand inhabitants and commerce must be on a large scale because in a single quarter whose name i have forgotten there are six thousand shops in the quarter called the kremlin there stands the fortress of the same name the old palace of the czars this fortress is as ancient as the town said to have been built about the middle of the twelfth century and is situated on an elevation at the foot of which flows the moskva but there is nothing remarkable in the style excepting its antiquity close to this pile whose walls are flanked with towers i was shown a bell of colossal dimensions half embedded in the ground and i was told it had never been possible to raise it in order to hang it in the palace chapel the cemeteries at moscow are stupendous and following the custom prevailing all over russia several times a year but especially on the day that in russia corresponds to our death day the cemeteries are filled with vast crowds men and women kneel at their family tombs and there give vent to loud lamentations which may be heard a long way off a habit as universal in moscow as in st petersburg is the taking of steam baths there are some for women and some for men only when the men have taken their bath coming out of it as red as scarlet they go out and roll in the snow in the most extreme cold to this habit the vigor and sound health of the russians have been attributed it is very certain they know nothing of chest maladies or rheumatism a pleasant walk in moscow is the market which is always to be found provisioned with the rarest and most excellent fruits it is in the middle of a garden and is traversed by a broad avenue which renders the place fascinating it is quite proper for the greatest ladies to go there and do their buying in person in summer they repair thither in carriages and in winter in sledges i had observed that in st petersburg society formed so to speak a single family all the members of the nobility being cousins to one another at moscow where the population and the nobility are far more numerous society becomes almost the public for instance you will find six thousand persons in the ballroom where the first families meet around this room runs a colonnade on a platform a few feet above the ground where the persons who are not dancing can promenade and adjoining are various apartments in which people sup or play cards I went to one of these balls and was surprised at the quantity of pretty women I found assembled. I can say the same for a ball to which Marshal Soltikoff invited me. The young women were nearly all of remarkable beauty. They had imitated the antique costume I had suggested to the Grand Duchess Elizabeth for Catherine II's ball. They wore cashmere tunics edged with gold fringes, 
gorgeous jewels held their short upturned sleeves in place their greek headdresses were for the most part tied with bands adorned with diamonds nothing could have been more stylish or luxurious than these costumes they beautified even this class of lovely women of whom no one was prettier than the next one i especially observed was a young person soon after married to prince tufakin her face whose features were regular and delicate wore an excessively melancholy expression after her marriage i began her portrait but was only able to finish the head in moscow so that i carried off the picture to finish it at st petersburg where however i before long heard of the death of that charming young lady she was scarcely more than seventeen years old i painted her as iris seated on some clouds with a billowy scarf about her madame soltikoff kept one of the best houses in moscow i had paid her a call upon arrival she and her husband who was then governor of the town showed me great kindness she asked me to paint the marshal's portrait and her daughters who had married count gregory orloff son of count vladimir at this time i was doing a picture of countess stroganov's daughter so that by the end of ten or twelve days i had begun six portraits without counting the likeness of the good and genial madame du crest de villeneuve whom i was charmed to meet again in moscow and who was so pretty that i insisted on painting her an accident that might have cost me my life deprived me of the use of my studio and retarded the completion of all these works i was enjoying perfect peace in the house loaned me by countess stroganoff but as it had not been inhabited for seven years it was horribly cold i remedied the evil as far as possible by heating all the stoves to the utmost in spite of this measure i was obliged to leave the fire lit in my bedroom at night and was so frozen in bed with the shutters hermetically closed to say nothing of a small lamp burning near me to moderate the air that i tied my pillow all round my head with a ribbon at the risk of being stifled one night when i had succeeded in going to sleep i was awakened by suffocating smoke i barely had time to ring for my maid who declared that she had put out all the fires i told her to open the passage door scarcely had she obeyed when her candle went out and my room and the whole apartment was filled with thick sickening smoke we broke the windows as fast as we could not knowing where this dreadful smoke came from it may well be imagined how anxious i was i then sent for one of the men who lit the fires and he informed me that another man had forgotten to open the cover capping the pipes which is on the roof i think relieved from the alarm of having set countess stroganoff's house on fire i went to look at my rooms all upset that i was near the room where i gave my sittings was a large stove with two doors in front of which i had put marshal soltikoff's picture to dry i found this portrait so thoroughly scorched that i obliged to do it over again but what gave me the most pain in this night of trouble was my inability to have removed at once a collection of pictures by various great masters sent me by my husband they of course suffered very much by five o'clock in the morning the smoke had only begun to disperse and as we had broken the windows the place was no longer tenable but what were we to do where to go i decided to send to good madame du crest de villeneuve she rushed over at once and took me off to her house where i remained a fortnight during which the dear woman showered attentions upon me which i shall never forget when i had concluded to go home i first went with monsieur du crest de villeneuve to examine the premises although the windows had not yet been replaced the whole house was still so redolent with smoke that it was impossible to think of living in it then i was exceedingly put out at this when count gregory orloff with that courtesy which is the natural heritage of the russians offered to lend me a vacant house belonging to him i accepted his offer and immediately went to settle in my new lodgings here by the way the rain poured in so hard that madame soltikoff coming to see me and wishing to stay a few minutes in the room where my pictures were exhibited asked me for an umbrella 
but in spite of this new form of discomfort i remained in the house until my departure from moscow the russian nobles display as much luxury at moscow as at st petersburg moscow possesses a multitude of splendid palaces most richly furnished one of the most sumptuous belonged to prince alexander kurikin whom i knew in st petersburg where i had twice painted his portrait on learning that i was in moscow he came to see me and invited me to dinner with my friends the comtesse du crest de villeneuve and her husband we found an immense palace ornamented externally with royal magnificence every room through which we passed was more handsomely furnished than the one preceding and in most of them was a picture of the master of the house either full or half length before leading us to table prince kurikin showed us his bedchamber which surpassed all the rest in elegance the bed standing on a raised platform laid with superb carpets was encircled by richly draped columns two statues and two vases with flowers stood at the four corners of the platform chairs of exquisite taste and divans of great price rendered this room a habitation worthy of venus to reach the dining-room we traversed broad corridors both sides of which were lined with liveried serfs holding torches which made me feel as though i was taking part in some grave and solemn ceremony during the dinner invisible musicians overhead diverted us with the horn playing i have already referred to prince kurikin's large fortune allowed him to maintain the establishment of a king he was an excellent man politely obliging toward his equals and not in the least haughty to his inferiors i also dined with prince galitzin universally sought after because of his affable and friendly ways although he was too old to sit down to table with his guests forty in number the luxurious and very abundant dinner nevertheless lasted more than three hours which tired me inexpressibly especially as i was placed opposite a tall window through which came a blinding light to me this banquet seemed unendurable but by way of compensation i had the pleasure before eating of going through a fine gallery containing pictures by great masters mixed it is true with some that were rather mediocre prince galitzin whom age and illness kept to his armchair had charged his nephew with doing me the honors this young man being ignorant of painting limited himself to explaining the subjects as best he could and i had difficulty in refraining from laughter when before a picture representing psyche being unable to pronounce the name he gave me the information that is fishy this long meal at prince galitzin's reminds me of another which probably never ended at all i had engaged to dine with a big stout enormously wealthy banker of moscow we were eighteen at table never in my life did i see such a collection of ugly and insignificant faces typical faces of money-makers when i had looked at them all once i dared not raise my eyes again for fear of meeting one of those visages there was no conversation they might have been taken for dummies if they had not eaten like ogres four hours went by in this fashion and i was bored to the verge of nausea at last i made up my mind and feigning indisposition i left them sitting at the table where they perhaps still are it was an unlucky day for that evening a rather comical episode occurred though it did not amuse me in the least for some reason or other i was obliged to make a call upon an english woman a lady of my acquaintance took me there and left me for some time after promising to come back for me as ill luck would have it this englishwoman knew not a word of french and myself not a word of english and it may readily be conceived how great was our mutual embarrassment i still see her before a little table between two candles lighting up a face as pale as death she thought it her duty from politeness to keep talking to me in a language i could not understand and i reciprocated by addressing her in french which she understood no better we remained together more than an hour 
which hour seemed to me a century and i imagine the poor english woman must have found it just as long at the period when i was in moscow the wealthiest resident of the town and perhaps of all russia was prince bezborodko he could have raised it is said an army of thirty thousand men on his estate so many peasants did he own these people as everybody knows being considered as part of the soil in russia on his different properties he owned a large number of serfs whom he treated with the greatest kindness and whom he caused to be instructed in various trades when i went to see him he showed me rooms full of furniture bought in paris from the workshops of the famous upholsterer de guerre most of this furniture had been imitated by his serfs and it was impossible to distinguish between copy and original it is this fine work which leads me to assert that the russian people are gifted with remarkable intelligence they understand everything and seem endowed with the talent of execution thus the prince de ligny wrote i see russians who are told to be sailors huntsmen musicians engineers painters actors and who become all these things according to their master's wish i see others sing and dance in the trenches plunged in snow and mud in the midst of musket and cannon shots and they are all alert attentive obedient and respectful prince bezborodko was a man of high ability he was employed in the reign of catherine the second and of paul first as secretary to the cabinet and then in seventeen eighty as secretary of state for foreign affairs in his desire to avoid the countless appeals by which he was besieged he made himself as inaccessible as possible women sometimes followed him into his carriage he would answer their demands with i shall forget and if it was a case of a petition with i shall lose it his greatest gift was a thorough and exact knowledge of the russian language in addition to this he boasted a phenomenal memory and an astonishing facility of putting his thoughts into words i give a well-known instance in proof thereof on one occasion the empress ordered him to draw up a ukase which however a great pressure of business caused him to forget the first time he saw the empress again after conferring with him on several matters of administration she asked him for the ukase bezborodko not the least bit in the world dismayed drew a sheet of paper out of his portfolio and without a moment's hesitation improvised the whole thing from beginning to end catherine was so well pleased with this presentment that she took the paper from him to look at it her surprise may be imagined at the sight of a sheet that was quite blank bezborodko began elaborate excuses but she stopped him with compliments and the next day made him privy councillor another russian whose memory was as marvellous as prince bezborodko's was Comte Bertoulin, whom I knew quite well at Moscow, where, by the way, we lived so far apart that whenever I supped with Countess Bertoulin, I was obliged to go two miles. The Comte, through his experience and his knowledge, is one of the most remarkable men I have ever known. He speaks all the languages with extraordinary ease, and his information on all sorts of subjects renders his conversation infinitely fascinating but his superiority over others never prevented him from being very unaffected nor from treating his friends with good nature and generosity he owned a huge library in moscow composed of the rarest and most valuable books in different languages his memory was such that when he was recounting a historical or any other anecdote he could at once tell in what room and on what shelf of his library the book was that he had just cited i was greatly amazed at this yet a thing as fully astonishing was to hear him talk of all the towns of europe and their most conspicuous features as if he had lived in them a long time whereas he had never once set foot outside of russia for my part i know that he spoke to me about paris and its buildings and everything curious to be seen there in such complete detail that i exclaimed it is impossible that you have not been in paris 
the request made to me for portraits in my agreeable social circle ought to have kept me longer in moscow where i stayed but five months of which i spent six weeks in my room but i was melancholy and ailing i felt a need of rest especially of breathing in a warmer climate i therefore resolved upon returning to st petersburg to see my daughter and then quitting russia i was however held back for some days by an unusually severe attack of my general indisposition end of chapter twelve recording by james k white chula vista chapter thirteen of memoirs of madame vigie le bon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 13. Goodbye to Russia. When I was sufficiently restored, I announced my departure and made my adieus everything was done to induce me to stay people offered to pay more for my portraits than i had received in st petersburg to allow me all the time i required to finish them without fatiguing myself i call to mind now the very day prior to my leaving while i was engaged in packing up on the ground floor of my house there suddenly appeared before me unannounced a man of colossal stature in a white cloak at whose sight I was nearly frightened to death. In Moscow, one continually saw people banished to Siberia by Paul, and although but two French had been exiled, both authors of infamous libels against Russia, I forthwith judged this stranger to be an emissary of Paul. I breathed freely only when I heard him beseeching me not to leave Moscow, and begging me to do a large likeness of his whole family, upon my refusal which i made as polite as possible the good gentleman asked me fervently at least to give my own portrait to the town i acknowledged that this last request so touched my heart as to leave me an enduring regret that my affairs and the state of my health prevented me from complying several persons who i doubt not were initiated into the revolutionary conspiracy under progress urged me to defer my departure for a few days promising they would go to st petersburg with me but in my complete ignorance of the plot i persisted in starting in which i made a great mistake for by waiting a little i might have avoided the hardships i underwent on those abominable roads again rendered well-nigh impracticable by a thaw it was on the twelfth of march eighteen o one when I was halfway between Moscow and St. Petersburg, that I heard the news of Paul's death. I found in front of the post-house a number of couriers who were about to spread the news in the different towns of the empire, and since they took all the horses, I could obtain none for myself. I was obliged to remain in my carriage, which had been put by the roadside on the bank of a river. Such a bitter wind was blowing that it froze me nevertheless i was compelled to pass the night there at last i contrived to hire some horses and i reached st petersburg only at eight or nine on the morning of the following day i found that city in a delirium of joy people were singing and dancing and kissing one another in the streets acquaintances of mine ran up to my carriage and squeezed my hands exclaiming what a blessing they told me that the houses had been illuminated the evening before in short the death of the unhappy prince gave rise to genial rejoicings none of the particulars of the dreadful occurrence were secret from anybody and i can aver that the accounts given me that day all agreed palin one of the conspirators had taken every means to frighten paul with a plot he alleged to have been hatched by the empress and her children for the purpose of seizing the throne. Paul's habitually suspicious mind 
incited him only too strongly to credit these false confidences which enraged him to the degree of ordering his wife and the grand dukes to be shut up in the fortress palin declined to obey without the emperor's signed authority paul gave his signature and palin at once went to alexander with the document you see he said that your father is mad and that you are all lost unless we forestall him by locking him up first alexander though believing his life and his family's in jeopardy did nothing but consent through silence to this idea which seemed merely to propose putting a lunatic out of harm's way but palin and his accomplices thought it necessary to go further five of the conspirators undertook the assassination one of them being plato zuboff a former pet of catherine whom paul had loaded with favors after recalling him from exile the five penetrated into paul's sleeping apartment after he had gone to bed the two guards at the door defended it valiantly but their resistance was fruitless and one of them was killed at the sight of the infuriated men rushing in upon him paul rose from his couch as he was very powerful he made a long fight against his murderers who finally managed to strangle him in an armchair the unhappy man's last words were you too zuboff i thought you were my friend it seems that chance had contributed in every way to the success of the plot a regiment of soldiers had been brought to surround the palace and the colonel far from being in the councils of the conspirators fully believed that an attempt upon the emperor's life was to be frustrated a portion of the regiment went through the garden to post themselves under paul's window unfortunately the marching of the soldiers did not awaken him nor did the noise of a flock of crows which were in the habit of sleeping on the roof and which burst out cawing had it been otherwise the ill-fated ruler would have had time to reach a secret staircase next to his room by which he could have descended to that of one madame narishkin in whom he had full confidence having got thus far nothing would have been easier for him than to make off in a little boat always moored on the canal beside the palace besides the distrust he harbored against his wife had caused him to double lock the door dividing his apartments from the empress's when he tried to escape through that door it was too late the assassins having taken the precaution to withdraw the key to crown all kutasov his faithful valet the very day the murder was committed received a letter revealing the conspiracy but this man had for some time been neglecting most of his duties and did not open his letters punctually kutasov left the letter disclosing the conspiracy on the table on opening the missive next day the unhappy man fell into such a desperate state that he nearly died of it the same was the case with the colonel who had placed his troops about the palace this young officer talisine by name learning of the crime that had been perpetrated felt such grief at his deception that he went home with a raging fever which nearly put an end to him i believe in fact that he did not long survive the blow all innocent that he was but what i am sure of is that alexander the first went to see him every day during his illness and interdicted some firing exercises too near the patient's house although the various impediments i have mentioned might have interfered with paul's killing it must be concluded that the contrivers of the scheme never doubted its issue for all st petersburg knew that on the night of the event a handsome young man in the plot named s blank key drew out his watch at midnight among a passably large company saying it must all be over by this time paul was dead indeed his body was forthwith embalmed and for six weeks he lay on a bed of state his face uncovered and showing scarcely a trace of decay owing to the fact that it was plastered with rouge the empress maria his widow went to kneel in prayer every day at the bed she took her two youngest sons nicholas and michael such small children that nicholas one day asked her why is papa always asleep the trick employed to make alexander the first consent to his father's deposal 
for he took no other view of the case was a fact vouched for to me by count stroganov one of the wisest and most upright men i have ever known and the best informed of all as to happenings at the russian court he doubted the less how easy it had been to induce paul to sign the order for his wife's and children's imprisonment as he was aware by what fearful suspicions the mind of that poor prince was haunted the very evening before the assassination there was a grand court concert at which the whole royal family was present during a moment's private conversation with count stroganov the emperor said to him no doubt you think me the happiest of men my friend at last i am living in this palace of st michael which i have had built and finely fitted out according to my own tastes i have my family about me here for the first time my wife is still good-looking my eldest son is handsome too and my daughters are charming there they are all of them opposite me but when i look at them i see my murderers in them all count stroganoff exclaimed recoiling horror-struck someone is lying to your majesty this is an infamous slander paul stared at him with haggard eyes and then pressing his hand declared what i have just told you is the truth i am firmly persuaded that alexander knew nothing of the attempt to be made upon his father's life if all the facts i was acquainted with at the time were not enough i have conviction from proof afforded by that prince's well-known character alexander i had a noble magnanimous heart not only was he always god-fearing but he was so honest that even in politics was he never known to resort to guile or deceit very well then on hearing that paul was no more his despair was so intense that no one who went near him could doubt his innocence of the murder the wiliest of men could not have summoned up all the tears he shed in the first hours of his grief he refused to be emperor and i know for certain that his wife elizabeth threw herself on her knees before him imploring him to take the reins of government he then went to his mother the empress who called to him as soon as she set eyes upon him from afar go away go away i see you all covered with your father's blood alexander raised his tearful eyes to heaven and said in accents coming from the soul i take god to witness mother that i did not order this awful crime to be done these few words bore such a thorough stamp of truth that the empress consented to listen to him and when she learned how the conspirators had cheated her son in the carrying out of their enterprise she fell at his feet with then i bow to my emperor alexander lifted her up knelt before her in turn took her in his arms and bestowed every mark of respect and affection upon her nor did he ever give the lie to this affection so long as he lived never did the emperor alexander refuse his mother anything and his respect toward her was so great that he insisted on maintaining all the honors of court etiquette for her thus she always took precedence before the empress elizabeth paul's death occasioned none of the upheavals which too often follow upon the departure of a ruler all those who had participated in his favor continued to keep the emoluments they owed to his patronage his valet kutasov that barber whom he made so rich whom he had decorated with the highest orders in russia remained peacefully in the enjoyment of his master's benefactions if there was no change in the lot of paul's friends it was otherwise with his victims exiles were called back and their property was restored to them justice was done to all who had been sacrificed to caprices without number in fact a golden era began for russia it was impossible to deny this at witnessing the love the regard and the enthusiasm of the russians for the new emperor that enthusiasm was so strong that all esteemed it the greatest thing to have seen to have met alexander if he went walking in the summer garden of an evening or if he passed along the streets of st petersburg the crowd would press about him and call down blessings upon him while he the most benevolent of princes would answer all these demonstrations with perfect graciousness 
i was unable to go to moscow for his coronation but some people who were there told me that nothing was ever more moving or more beautiful the transports of popular gladness vented themselves all over the city and in the church when alexander placed the diamond crown on the empress elizabeth's head radiant with beauty they formed such a lovely pair as to evoke unbounded acclaim in the midst of the universal elation i was myself fortunate enough to meet the emperor on one of the st petersburg quays a few days after my arrival he was on horseback and although paul's regulations had of course been abolished i had my carriage stopped for the pleasure of seeing alexander pass he rode up to me at once asked me how i liked moscow and whether the roads had given me any trouble i replied that i regretted having been unable to stay long enough in that glorious city to see all its splendors as for the roads i acknowledged they were abominable he agreed with me saying he hoped to have them mended then after paying me a thousand compliments he left me next day count stroganoff came to me on the emperor's behalf with a command to paint him at half length and also on horseback no sooner was this news spread than numbers of court people rushed to my house asking for a copy of either portrait they cared not which so long as they had one of alexander at any other time of my life this would have been an opportunity to make a fortune but alas my physical condition to say nothing of the mental suffering still besetting me prohibited me from taking advantage of it feeling unfit to work at a full-length picture i did a pastel bust portrait of the emperor and one of the empress these i intended to enlarge at dresden or berlin in case i should be obliged to leave st petersburg it was not long in fact before my ailments became unbearable the doctor i consulted ordered me to take the waters at carlsbad i cannot describe the regrets i experienced at leaving st petersburg where i had spent such happy years it was not without an aching heart that i bade my daughter good-bye bitter though it was to see her estranged from me to see her completely under the thumb of a clique headed by the vile governess whom i would accuse of everything evil a few days prior to my departure my son-in-law remarked that he did not conceive how i could quit st petersburg at the moment most favorable to my fortune you will admit i answered that my heart must be very sick the reason you can easily guess other separations i likewise found most painful the princesses kurikin and dolgoruki that excellent count stroganoff who had given me so many proofs of friendship that was what i regretted far more than the fortune i was renouncing i remember how the dear count came to see me as soon as he heard i was going he was so perturbed that he walked up and down the studio where i was painting muttering to himself no no she won't go away it is impossible my daughter who was present thought he was turning mad to all the kindly proffered demonstrations of attachment i could not answer except by a promise to return to st petersburg and such was then my firm intention when i had quite decided to depart i asked for an audience with the empress which was immediately granted and on presenting myself i found the emperor there too i testified my liveliest and sincerest regrets to their majesties telling them my health compelled me to take the waters at carlsbad recommended to me for stoppages to this the emperor affably replied do not go so far in search of a remedy i will give you the empress's horse and after riding it for some time you will be cured i thanked the emperor a hundred times for the offer but confessed that i did not know how to ride well he resumed i will give you a riding master to take you out i cannot say how touched i was by such kindness and on taking leave of their majesties i sought in vain for terms strong enough to express my gratitude a few days after this interview i met the empress walking in the summer garden i was with my daughter and monsieur de riviere her majesty stepped up to me saying 
do not leave us i beg of you madame lebrun remain here and take care of your health i cannot bear to have you go i assured her it was my desire and my purpose to return to st petersburg for the pleasure of seeing her again god knows i spoke the truth but i have none the less often been assailed with the fear that my refusal to stay in russia may have appeared as ingratitude to their majesties and that they may not have quite forgiven me on crossing the russian border i burst into tears i wanted to retrace my journey and i vowed to come back to those who had for so long heaped tokens of friendship and devotion upon me and whose memory is ever in my heart but one must believe in fate for i never again saw the country which i still look upon as a second motherland end of chapter 13 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 14 of memoirs of madame vigie le bon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista memoirs of madame vigie le bon by elizabeth louise vigie le bon translated by lionel strachey chapter fourteen homeward bound i left st petersburg sad sick and alone in my carriage having been unable to keep my russian maid i had nobody but a very old man who wanted to go to prussia and whom i had given a servant's place through pity which i had cause to regret because he got so drunk at every stage that he had to be carried back to the box Monsieur de Riviere, escorting me in his calash, was of no great assistance to me, especially after crossing the Russian frontier and entering the sandy district, for his postilions, from whom he did not know how to exact obedience, were continually taking side roads, while I followed the main road. My first stop I made at Narva, a well-fortified but ugly, ill-paved little town. The road leading there is entrancing, it is edged with pretty houses and English gardens. In the distance is the sea, covered with ships, which makes this route extremely picturesque. The women of Narva wear the dress of ancient times. They are good-looking, for the people of Livonia in general are splendid. Nearly all the heads of the old men reminded me of Raphael's Heads of Christ, and the young men, their long hair falling on their shoulders, might have been models to that great painter. The day after my arrival I went to visit a magnificent cataract at some distance from the town. A huge mass of water, you cannot tell where it comes from, forms a torrent so rapid and powerful that in its course it runs up enormous rocks, from which it tumbles noisily down to rush up other rocks. The multitudinous cascades thus shooting after each other in succession and swallowing each other up produce a terrifying din while i was occupied in sketching this beautiful horror some of the inhabitants of narva who were watching me told me of a dreadful thing they had witnessed the waters of the cataract swollen by great rains had carried away some of the bank and with it a house that was the home of a family the cries of distress of the unfortunates were heard and their frightful plight was seen but no aid could be given them since it was impossible to steer a boat in the torrent the heart-rending spectacle was finally followed by one far more shocking when the house and the unhappy family were engulfed and disappeared before the eyes of those who were now narrating the catastrophe and who were still quite affected by it arriving at riga i found that this town like narva was neither handsome nor well paved but it is known to be a great commercial place and has a fine harbor most of the men are habited like Turks or Poles, and all women not of the populace put a gauze veil over their heads when they go out. I scarcely had time to make other observations, as I was hastening to reach Mittau, where I still hoped to find the royal family. But to my annoyance I arrived too late and did not meet them, so that I made but a short stay in this town, where I had only gone for the sake of seeing our princes. 
i had taken the post from st petersburg but at riga we met the grand duchess of baden who was on her way to the empress her daughter and who left not a horse on our route i was obliged to hire horses at livery stables and the coachman instead of putting me down for the night at the post-houses took me to wretched cabins where there were no beds and nothing to eat so that in most cases i spent the night in my carriage as for food the soup i got was made without meat but with carrots and bad butter if i had a fowl killed it was so lean and so tough that monsieur de riviere and i were unable to cut it and we barely had time to finish these miserable meals in so great haste were the liverymen to resume the journey we drove through such deep sand that the horses went at a walk it was frightfully hot in order to get air i was obliged to leave all my windows open and both postilions smoked incessantly the vile odor of their pipes sickened me so that i preferred to walk most of the time they smoked although i was up to my ankles in sand fortunately no robbers are ever met with on these roads true i noticed wolves on the neighboring heights but apparently they were afraid of us for they always fled when we drew near and so did the poor stags which i frequently saw crossing the road when alarmed by monsieur de riviere's calash in my state of health such hardships were bound to tell upon me a few days in fact were enough to break me down to such a degree that not to succumb altogether it needed all my courage and my lively determination not to interrupt the journey i became so weak and ill that i had to drag myself to my carriage where i remained motionless bereft even of the ability to think the only sensation i had was a sharp pain in the right side caused by rheumatism and intensified with every jolt this pain was so unbearable that one day when we were driving on a road under repair and full of stones i fainted away in the carriage a part of my torture ended at Königsberg. there i took the post as far as berlin where i arrived about the end of july eighteen o one at ten in the evening but though i needed rest so badly i was first to undergo the ordeal of the custom house i was made to enter a large dark vault where i waited a full two hours the customs officers then said they wanted to hold my carriage so as to examine it at night which would have compelled me to walk to the inn in the pouring rain i argued with these men in french and they answered me in german it was enough to drive one to distraction they would not even allow me to take out a nightcap and a little vial containing an antispasmodic of which i certainly would stand in great need after such a trial i was so hoarse from shouting at the barbarians that i could not speak at last i obtained permission to leave the custom house in my carriage and i went to the city of paris inn with a customs officer a real demon and dead drunk into the bargain he opened my luggage and turned everything pell-mell appropriating a piece of embroidered indian stuff given me by madame du barry on my departure from paris as i did not wish my sibyl or the studies i had made of the emperor and empress of russia to be unrolled my carriage was put under seal and at last i was able to get to bed early next day i sent for monsieur ronsbach my banker who settled all my difficulties with the custom house three days sufficed to rest me from the fatigues of my journey and i was feeling much better when the queen of prussia who was then absent from berlin was kind enough to request my presence at potsdam where she desired me to do her portrait i went but my pen is incapable of rendering the impression which the first sight of that princess made upon me the beauty of her heavenly face that expressed benevolence and goodness and whose features were so regular and delicate the loveliness of her figure neck and arms the exquisite freshness of her complexion all was enchanting beyond anything imaginable she was in deep mourning and wore a coronet of black jet which far from being to her disadvantage brought out the dazzling whiteness of her skin one must have seen the queen of prussia in order to understand how bewitched i was when i first beheld her she made an appointment for the first sitting i cannot she said give it to you before noon 
because the king reviews the troops at ten every morning and likes me to attend she wanted to lodge me in the palace but knowing that this must inconvenience one of her ladies i declined with thanks and took quarters in a neighboring hotel where i was very badly off in every way my stay at potsdam was nevertheless a veritable delight to me for the more i saw of that charming queen the more was i sensible to the privilege of being in her company she seemed to wish to see the studies i had made of the emperor alexander and the empress elizabeth i promptly brought them to her as well as my sibyl which i had stretched i cannot say how graciously she praised this picture she was so friendly and so kind that the feeling she inspired was altogether one of affection i look back with pleasure upon all the marks of favor that her majesty showered upon me even in the slightest matters for instance i was in the habit of taking coffee of a morning and in my hotel it was always atrocious somehow i told the queen about this and the next day she sent me some that was excellent another time when i complimented her on her bracelets which were in the antique style she at once removed them from her arms and put them on mine this gift was more welcome to me than a fortune would have been from that day forth those bracelets have traveled with me everywhere she was also obliging enough to give me a box at the theatre quite near hers from this place of vantage i enjoyed above all looking at her majesty whose lovely face was like that of a sixteen-year-old girl during one of our sittings the queen sent for her children to my great surprise i found that they were ugly in showing them to me she said they are not pretty i confess i had not the courage to deny it i contented myself with replying that their faces had a great deal of character besides the two pastels i made of her majesty i did two others of prince ferdinand's family one of the young princesses louise who had married prince radzivill was pretty and very genial for some time i had a delightful correspondence with her i count her as one of the people one can never forget her husband was a thorough musician i remember a surprise he caused me arising solely from a difference in national customs during my sojourn at berlin i was taken to a grand public concert and was amazed to the last degree upon entering the hall to see prince radzivill performing on the harp such a thing would be impossible with us never could an amateur especially a prince play before anyone but his own social circle and certainly not before people who paid i suppose in prussia it was quite usual in berlin i made the acquaintance of the baroness de krudener so well known for her cleverness and her rhapsodical notions her renown as an author was already established but she had not yet gained the reputation of a religious prophet that made her so famous in the north she and her husband treated me with great civility i can say the same for madame de Sousa, the portuguese ambassadress whose portrait i painted at the time on first arriving at berlin i called upon the french ambassador general bournonville for i was at last beginning to consider a return to paris my friends and particularly my brother urgently suggested i should do so they had easily had my name taken off the list of exiles so that i was re-established as a frenchwoman which in spite of all i had ever remained in my heart although general bournonville was the first republican ambassador i visited i had already seen others toward the end of my stay at st petersburg general duroc and monsieur chateaugiron appeared at alexander's court as envoys of bonaparte and i remember hearing the empress elizabeth saying to the emperor when are we to receive the citizens monsieur de chateaugiron called upon me i was as polite as in me lay but that tricolored cockade affected me unspeakably a few days later they both dined at princess galatzine's at table i found myself next to general duroc who was said to have been one of napoleon's intimates he addressed not a single word to me and i did likewise to him the dinner i speak of gave rise to a rather amusing incident the princess's cook 
wholly ignorant of the french revolution naturally took these gentlemen for ambassadors from the king of france wishing to honor them after much reflection he bethought himself that the lily was the emblem of france and accordingly arranged his truffles and fillets and sweetmeats in that pattern this so took the guests aback that the princess fearing no doubt she was suspected of a bad joke called up the cook and asked him what all the lilies meant said the worthy soul with an air of proud satisfaction i wanted to show your excellency that i knew the proper thing to do on great occasions a few days before i said farewell to berlin the director-general of the academy of painting most courteously came to me in person with my diploma as a member of said academy the many tokens of goodwill heaped upon me at the prussian capital and court would assuredly have kept me longer had my plans not been definitely fixed hence being resolved to go i bade good-bye to that dear kind lovely young queen all unwitting alas how few years after i was to be shocked with the news of her death at starting from berlin i was threatened with the loss of everything i owned and this is how it happened my horses were ordered for five o'clock in the morning my manservant must have gone to make his adieus to some friends for he did not appear and in prussia as everyone knows horses do not wait i got up and dressed in a thoroughly sleepy condition meanwhile the porter of my hotel not seeing my man took my jewel case downstairs with my remaining effects this jewel case which contained all my diamonds and other ornaments and my cash my whole fortune in fact i always had under my feet when traveling by the greatest luck as soon as i got into my carriage though half asleep i noticed that my feet were not supported as usual the horses were just off i cried out to have them stopped and then called to the porter for my jewel case purposely making enough noise to wake the mistress of the house and i was successful for after some evasions by the porter the case was brought out it had been found in a stable at the back of the yard all covered with hay the incident had given my man time to arrive and i drove away in high spirits as may well be imagined at having recovered both my servant and my jewel case i record the adventure thinking it may be useful as a lesson to absent-minded travelers from berlin i went to dresden and then on to brunswick where i spent a few days with the riviere family between brunswick and weimar my postilion lost the way and we were stuck for hours in the heaviest soil i remember that as a truce to my impatience and more particularly to my appetite i gathered up some of that wretched earth and tried to model a head with it i really achieved something that looked like a face though furnished with letters for the court of weimar i did not present them but after a day's rest proceeded to gotha here i met an old friend i had known in paris baron grimm who very civilly attended to all my wants for the journey which i did not again interrupt until i reached frankfurt we were obliged to wait at frankfurt for six days during which i was very much bored to pass the time i mended my old shirts and the lord knows what sort of sewing that was on reaching paris i engaged a chambermaid who remarked when she saw my mending anyone can see that madame has been in a savage country for this is sewn like the devil i laughed and informed her that it was my own handiwork the poor girl quite embarrassed was eager to take back what she had said but i reassured her by acknowledging that i had never been an adept with the needle i will not attempt to describe my feelings at setting foot on the soil of france from which i had been absent twelve years i was stirred by terror grief and joy in turn i mourned the friends who had died on the scaffold but i was to see those again who still lived this france that i was entering once more had been the scene of horrible crimes but this france was my country end of chapter fourteen recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Fifteen of Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 15. Old Friends and New. On my arrival in Paris, at our house in the Rue Grosse Chenet, Monsieur Le Bon, my brother, my sister-in-law, and her daughter, were awaiting me when I alighted from my carriage. They were all weeping for joy, and I, too, was deeply moved. I found the staircase lined with flowers, and my apartment in complete readiness. The hangings and curtains of my bedroom were in green cloth, the curtains edged with yellow-watered silk. Monsieur Lebrun had had a crown of gilt stars put over the bedstead. The furniture was all convenient and in good taste, and I felt altogether comfortably installed. Although Monsieur Lebrun made me pay dearly enough for all this, I, nevertheless, appreciated the pains he had taken to make my place of abode agreeable. The house in the Rue Grosse Chenet was separated by a garden from a house facing the Rue de Clary, which also belonged to Monsieur Lebrun. In this second house was a great room where very fine concerts were given. I was taken there the evening of my arrival, and as soon as I entered the place, everybody turned in my direction, the audience clapping their hands, the musicians rapping on their violins with their bows. I was so touched by this flattering testimony that I gave way to tears. I called to mind that Madame Tallien was at this concert, radiant with beauty. My first visitor next day was Grus, whom I found unchanged. You would even have said that he had never undressed his hair, for the same locks waved at each side of his head, just as before my departure. I was grateful for his attention, and very glad to see him again. After Grus came my good friend Madame de Bonil, as pretty as ever. The dear creature was preserved in a truly wonderful manner. She told me that her daughter, Madame Renaud de Saint-Jean d'Angly, was to give a ball the following night, and that I must come unfailingly. I answered that I had no ball dress, and then showed her that famous piece of Indian stuff given me by Madame du Barry which had gone through such great adventures since being in my possession. Madame de Bonil declared it admirable, and sent it to Madame Germain, the celebrated dressmaker who immediately made me a fashionable gown, which she brought me that very evening. So I went to Madame Renaud de Saint-Jean d'Angly's ball, and I saw the handsomest women of the period, first among them Madame Renaud herself, and next Madame Viconti so remarkable for her beauty of both figure and face. While amusing myself with looking over all these lovely ladies, someone sitting in front of me turned round. She was so exquisite that I could not help exclaiming, Oh, how beautiful you are! It was Madame Joubertin, then portionless, who afterward married Lucien Bonaparte. I also saw a number of French generals at this ball. MacDonald, Merriman and several others were pointed out to me. In fact, this was a new society. A few days after my return, Madame Bonaparte called upon me one morning. She spoke of the balls at which we had been together before the Revolution. She was most cordial, and even invited me to dinner at the First Consul's. However, the date of this dinner was never mentioned. My friend Robert soon paid me a visit, and so did the Brognards and Manegot. I was very deeply touched with the joy testified by the friends and acquaintances who crowded to see me every day. But the pleasure of greeting them all was bitterly mingled with sorrow at learning of many deaths I was ignorant of, for not an individual came who had not lost a mother, a husband, or some relation. And I had another trial to undergo, worse than all the rest. Good manners demanded a visit to my odious stepfather. He still lived at Nouilly, in a small house bought by my father, where I had often been in my early youth. 
everything in the place reminded me of my poor mother and my happy days with her i found her work-basket just as she had left it in short the visit was the more sad for me as i was mournfully inclined going to neuilly i for the first time recrossed the louis fifteenth square where i still seemed to see the blood of a host of noble victims my brother who was with me reproached himself for not having made our carriage take a different route since i was suffering beyond belief at this very day i never pass that square without calling up the horrors it has witnessed i cannot control my imagination the first time i went to the play the house looked exceedingly dull to me accustomed as i had been in france and abroad to see everyone powdered those dark heads and those men in dark clothes made a melancholy picture you would have thought the audience had assembled to go to a funeral in general paris had a less lively appearance to me the streets seemed so narrow that i was tempted to believe double rows of houses had been built this was no doubt due to my recent impressions of st petersburg and berlin where the streets for the most part are very wide but what displeased me far more was still to see liberty fraternity or death written on the walls these words sanctified by the terror aroused the saddest thoughts in me touching the past and inspired me with some fears for the future i was taken to see a great review by the first consul in the square of the louvre i stood at a window in the museum and recollect that i refused to acknowledge the tiny man i saw to be bonaparte the duc de crillon who was beside me had all the difficulty in the world to convince me here as in the case of catherine the second i had depicted such a famous man in the shape of a giant not long after my arrival bonaparte's brothers came to view my works they were very civil toward me and said the most flattering things lucien especially inspected my sibyl quite minutely and proffered me a thousand praises on account of it my first visits were to my good old friends the marquis de grolier madame de verdun and the comtesse d'anleu whose two daughters i saw at the same time madame de rosambeau and madame d'orglande both worthy of their mother in mind and good looks i likewise went to see madame de segur i found her lonely and dejected her husband had no post and they were living in straitened circumstances later when i came back from london bonaparte made the comte de segur master of ceremonies which gave them an easy life I remember how about this time going to see the comtesse segur toward eight in the evening and finding her alone she said to me you would scarcely believe i've had twenty people to dinner they all went after the coffee i was indeed rather surprised because before the revolution most of the guests you had to dinner would remain with you until evening which i thought much more proper than the new method at the same time madame de segur invited me to a large musical party at which all the notables of the day came together here i had occasion to observe another innovation which seemed to me no better than the first i was astonished when i entered the room to find all the men on one side and all the women on the other like hostile forces you would have said not a man came over to our side excepting the master of the house the comte de segur impelled by his old habits of gallantry to pay the ladies a few compliments madame de canisi was announced a very handsome woman with the figure of a painter's model and then we lost our only night for the comte went to lay himself at the feet of this beauty and did not leave her the whole evening i was seated next to madame de bassano who had been praised highly to me and whom i had thus been anxious to see she seemed very much wrapped up in the diamond monogram given me by the queen of naples when i bade that princess farewell moreover considering me probably as an interloper since i was neither a minister's wife nor a lady of the court she spoke not a single word to me which did not however prevent me from looking at her repeatedly and judging her extremely pretty the first artist i went to see was monsieur vian who had formerly been created first painter to the king 
and whom bonaparte had recently nominated senator he was then eighty-two years old monsieur vian had been regarded as heading the restoration of the french school after this visit i went to monsieur gerard's already famous for his pictures belisarius and psyche he had just finished a fine portrait of madame bonaparte reclining on a sofa which was to add yet more to his reputation in this style of painting madame bonaparte's portrait made me wish to see that which gerard had done of madame recamier so i went to that lovely woman's house delighted with the chance of making her acquaintance one woman there was who rivalled madame recamier in respect of beauty this was madame tallien besides her great beauty she had great goodness of heart in the revolution a host of victims condemned to death owed their lives to the influence she exercised upon tallien the rescued ones called her our lady of good help she received me most graciously later after marrying the prince de chimay she inhabited a palatial house at the end of the rue de babylon where she and her husband diverted themselves with giving plays they both acted very well she invited me to see one of these pieces and came to several of my evening parties i had the felicity too at this time of knowing Ducy, whose admirable character equalled his rare talent the ease and simplicity of all his ways contrasted so well with the splendid imagination with which heaven had gifted him that i have never known a more lovable man than this excellent Ducy. the sole regret of his friends was that they were unable to induce him to settle in paris but he disliked the city and the author of oedipus and othello demanded shepherds and pastures to make his life agreeably consistent the solitary mode of existence he rejoiced in caused me a surprise or rather a fright which i shall never forget after my return from london i went to see him at versailles whither as i was aware he had retired it was in the evening i knocked at his door and it was opened to me by madame perry the architect's widow candle in hand i thought she had died long ago and i uttered a scream while I tried to collect my wits, she related how she had lately been married to Ducy. At last I understood, and composed myself. She led me to her husband, whom I found alone in a little room on the top floor of the house, buried in books and manuscripts. Nothing in this abode seemed to me either pastoral or pleasant, but, by the aid of his imagination, Ducy turned this attic, which he called his lookout, into a place of delight i met madame campan again with much pleasure she was then playing a somewhat important part in what was soon to become the reigning family one day she asked me to dinner at saint germain where her boarding school was established at table i sat near madame murat napoleon's sister but we were so placed that i could see only her profile particularly as she did not turn her head in my direction in the evening the young ladies of the school gave us a performance of esther in which mademoiselle augier who afterward married marshal ney enacted the leading role very well bonaparte was one of the spectators he was seated in the first row and i posted myself in the second in a corner but near enough to observe him conveniently though i was in a dark spot madame campan came to tell me between two acts that he had guessed who i was i was glad to notice a bust of marie antoinette in madame campan's room i felt grateful to her because of this and she confided to me that bonaparte approved of it which i thought very proper on his part it is true that at this period there seemed no need for him to have any fears relating either to the past or the future his victories evoked enthusiasm from the french and even from foreigners he had many admirers among the english especially and i recall one day when i went to dine with the duchess of gordon she showed me bonaparte's portrait saying in french there is my zero 
as she pronounced french very badly i understood that she meant hero and we both laughed heartily over my explanation of zero the large number of strangers i knew in paris and the desire to dispel an unconquerable melancholy prompted me to give some evening parties princess dolgoruki was anxious to meet the abbe de lille so i requested his presence at supper with several other people worthy of listening to him though this charming poet had gone blind he had nevertheless kept his cheerfulness of disposition he recited some of his beautiful lines to us and we were all enchanted by them on another occasion i arranged a supper at which all the great personages of the day were present and among the ambassadors was monsieur de metternich then i gave a ball to which madame hamelin monsieur de trigny and other renowned dancers came madame hamelin was regarded as the best dancer in paris society certainly she was exquisitely graceful and fleet of foot i remember how at this ball madame dimidoff danced the russian waltz so entrancingly that we stood on our chairs to watch her having a suitable room in my house on the rue gros chenet i conceived the idea of putting in a stage and giving plays the spectators included all persons of distinction in all these gatherings i aimed at paying back the russians and germans in paris a few of the favors they had so thoughtfully and amiably rendered me in their own country almost every day i saw princess dolgoruki who had been such an angel to me in st petersburg she enjoyed being in paris very well one evening i found the vicomte de segur at her house i had often seen him before the revolution he was then young and fashionable and made a thousand conquests through his personal graces when i saw him again at the princess's his face was expressionless and wrinkled he wore a wig with symmetrical curls at each side leaving his forehead bald another twelve years and the wig aged him so that i could barely recognize him excepting by his voice princess dolgoruki came to see me the day of her presentation to bonaparte i asked her what she thought of the first consul's court it is not a court she replied but a power the thing must of course have appeared to her in that light being accustomed to the court of st petersburg which is so large and brilliant whereas at the tuileries she found few women and a prodigious number of military men of all grades among all the amusements that residence in paris afforded me i was none the less pursued by innumerable black thoughts which assailed me even in the midst of pleasures to put an end to such a painful state of mind i determined to take a journey more than once while i was at rome the newspapers had had it that i was at london but the fact was i had never seen that city accordingly i resolved to go there end of chapter 15 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 16 of memoirs of madame vigie le bon this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Memoirs of Madame Vigie Le Bon by Elizabeth Louise Vigie Le Bon. Translated by Lionel Strachey. Chapter 16. Unmarry England. I started for London on the 15th of April, 1802. I knew not a word of English. True, I was accompanied by an English maid, but the girl had long been serving me badly, and I was obliged to dismiss her very shortly after my arrival in London, because she did nothing but eat bread and butter all day. Luckily, I had brought someone besides, a charming person to whom ill fortune made the home she had found under my roof very precious. This was my faithful Adelaide who lived with me on the footing of a friend and whose attentions and counsels have always been most valuable to me on disembarking at dover i was at first somewhat affrighted at the view of a whole population assembled on the shore 
but i was reassured when informed that the crowd was simply composed of curious idlers who were following their usual habits in coming down to see the travellers land the sun was going down i at once hired a three-horse chase and made off forthwith for i was not without apprehensions seeing i had been told i might very likely encounter highwaymen i took the precaution of putting my diamonds into my stockings and was glad i had done so when i perceived two horsemen advancing toward me at a gallop what capped the climax of my fears was to see them separate in order as i imagined to present themselves at the two windows of my carriage i confess i was seized with a violent fit of trembling but that was the worst that happened vast and handsome though london may be that city affords less food for the artist's interest than paris or the italian towns not that you do not find a great number of rare works of art in england but most of them are owned by wealthy private persons whose country houses and provincial seats they adorn at the period i mention london had no picture gallery that now existing being the result of legacies and gifts to the nation made within a few years in default of pictures i went to look at the public edifices i returned several times to westminster abbey where the tombs of the kings and queens are superb as they belong to different ages they offer great attractions to artists and fanciers i admired among others the tomb of mary stuart in which the remains of that ill-fated queen were deposited by her son james i i spent much time in that part of the church devoted to the sepulchre of the great poets milton pope and chatterton this last named is known to have poisoned himself while dying of starvation and i reflected that the money laid out upon rendering him these posthumous honors might have sufficed when he was alive to ensure him comfortable days st paul's cathedral is also very fine its dome is an imitation of that of st peter's at rome at the Tower of London I saw a very interesting collection of armor dating from the various centuries. There is a row of royal figures on horseback, among them Elizabeth, mounted on a courser, and ready to review her troops. The London Museum contains a collection of minerals, birds, weapons, and tools from the South Sea Islands, due to the famous Captain Cook. The streets of London are wide and clean, broad side pavements make them very convenient for foot passengers and one is the more surprised to witness scenes upon them that ought to be proscribed by civilization it is not rare to see boxers fighting and wounding each other to the point of drawing blood far from such a spectacle seeming to shock the people looking on they give them glasses of gin to stimulate their zeal sunday in london is as dismal as the climate not a shop is open there are no plays nor balls nor concerts universal silence reigns and as on that day no one is allowed to work nor even to play music without incurring the risk of having his windows broken by the populace there is no resource for killing time but the public walks these indeed are very well frequented the chief amusement of the town is the assembling of good company called a rout two or three hundred individuals walk up and down the rooms the women arm in arm for the men usually keep aside in this crowd one is pushed and jostled without end so that it becomes very fatiguing but there is nothing to sit on at one of these routs i attended an englishman i knew in italy caught sight of me he came up to me and said in the midst of the profound silence that reigns at all these parties don't you think these gatherings are enjoyable you enjoy yourselves with what would bore us i replied i really did not see what pleasure was to be got out of stifling in such a crowd that you could not even reach your hostess nor are the walks in london any livelier the women walk together on one side all dressed in white they are so taciturn and so perfectly placid that they might be taken for perambulating ghosts the men hold aloof from them and behave just as solemnly i have sometimes come upon a couple and have amused myself if i happened to follow them a while by watching whether they would speak to each other i never saw any who did 
i went to the principal painters and was mightily astonished to see that they all had a large room full of portraits with nothing but the heads done i asked them why they thus exhibited their pictures before finishing them they all answered that the persons who had posed were satisfied with being seen and mentioned and that besides the sketch made half the price was paid in advance when the painter was satisfied too at london i saw many pictures by the renowned reynolds their coloring is excellent resembling that of titian but they are mostly unfinished except as to the head i however admired a child samuel by him whose completeness and coloring both pleased me reynolds was as modest as he was talented when my portrait of monsieur de cologne arrived at the london custom house reynolds who had been apprised of the fact went to look at it when the box was opened he stood absorbed in the picture for a long space and praised it warmly thereupon some nincompoop ejaculated that must be a fine portrait madame lebrun was paid eighty thousand francs for it i am sure replied reynolds i could not do it as well for a hundred thousand the london climate was the despair of this artist because of the difficulty it offers in drawing pictures and he had invented i heard a way of mixing wax with his colors which made them dull in truth the dampness in london was such that to dry the pictures i painted there i had a fire constantly burning in my studio until the moment i went to bed i would set my pictures at a certain distance from the fireplace and often would leave a route to go and ascertain whether they wanted moving nearer the grate or farther away this slavery was unavoidable and unendurable concerts were very much the fashion in london and i preferred them to the routes though these afforded an opportunity to the well-received foreigner and fortunately i was one of meeting all the best english society invitations are not by letter as in france only a card is sent with the inscription at home such and such a day the most fashionable woman in london at this time was the duchess of devonshire i had often heard of her beauty and her influence in politics and when i called upon her she greeted me in the most affable style she might then have been about forty-five years old her features were very regular but i was not struck by her beauty her complexion was too high and ill fortune had ordained that one of her eyes should be blind as at this period the hair was worn over the forehead she concealed the eye under a bunch of curls but that was insufficient to hide such a serious defect the duchess of devonshire was of fair size her degree of stoutness being exactly appropriate to her age and her unconstrained manner became her exceedingly well not long after my arrival in london the treaty of amiens was abrogated and all french who had not lived in england over a year were compelled to leave the country at once the prince of wales to whom i was presented assured me that i was not to be included in this edict that he would oppose my expulsion and that he would immediately ask his father the king for a permit allowing me to remain the permit stating all necessary particulars was granted me it mentioned that i was at liberty to travel anywhere within the kingdom that i might sojourn wherever i pleased and also that i must be protected in the seaport towns i might elect to stop at a favor which old french residents of england had great difficulty in securing at this juncture the prince of wales went to the limit of politeness by bringing the document to me in person the prince of wales might then have been about forty but he looked older which was to be accounted for by his stoutness tall and well built he had a handsome face his features were all regular and distinguished he wore a wig very artistically disposed the hair parted on the forehead like the apollo de belvedere's and this suited him to perfection he was proficient in all the bodily exercises and spoke french very well and with the greatest fluency he was elaborately elegant magnificently so to the extent of prodigality at one time he was reputed to have debts to the amount of three hundred thousand pounds 
which were finally paid by his father and parliament as he was one of the handsomest men in the united kingdom he was the idol of the women it was but a little while before my departure that i did his portrait i painted him at almost full length in uniform several english painters became enraged against me on hearing that i had begun this picture and that the prince allowed me all the time i asked to finish it for they had long and vainly been waiting for the same concession i was aware that the queen mother said her son was making love to me and that he often came to lunch at my house never did the prince of wales enter my door in the forenoon except for his sittings as soon as his likeness was done the prince gave it to madame fitzherbert she had it put in a rolling frame like a large bedroom mirror so as to move it into any of her rooms something which i thought highly ingenious the anger of the english artists toward me did not stop at talk a certain monsieur blank a portrait painter published a work in which he vehemently belittled french painting in general and my own in particular sundry parts of the book were translated to me and they appeared so unjust and absurd that i could not help springing to the defence of the famous painters whose countrywoman i was accordingly i wrote to monsieur blank as follows sir i understand that in your work on painting you speak of the french school as from what is reported to me concerning your remarks i gather that you have not the least idea of that school i think i must give you some information that you may find serviceable i presume in the first place that you do not attack the great artists who lived in the reign of louis the fourteenth such as lebrun lesur simon vouet etc and rigaud minard and larguier the portrait painters as for the artists of the day you do the french school the greatest injustice in rating it by its achievements of thirty years ago since then it has made enormous strides in a branch totally different from that signalizing its decline not however that the man who ruined it was not gifted with a very superior talent boucher was a born colorist he had discrimination in composing and good taste in the choice of his figures but of a sudden he stopped working except for the dainty chambers of women when his colouring became insipid his style affected and this example once set all painters tried to follow it his defects were carried to the extreme as always happens things went from bad to worse and art seemed irretrievably destroyed then came an able painter called vien whose style was simple and severe he was appreciated by true art lovers and regenerated our school we have since produced david young louis drouy who died at rome aged twenty-five just as he seemed to give promise of becoming a second raphael gerard gros giraudet guerin and a number of others i might cite it is not surprising that after criticizing the works of david which you evidently do not know at all you do me the honor of criticizing mine which you know no better being ignorant of the english language i had not been able to read what you wrote about my painting and when i was told without being given the particulars that you had abused me soundly i answered that however much you might disparage my pictures all the worst you could say of them would be less than i think i do not suppose that any artist imagines he has attained perfection and far from any such presumption on my part i have never yet been quite satisfied with any work of mine nevertheless being now more fully informed and knowing that your criticism bears principally on a point that appears important to me i believe my duty is to repudiate it in the interest of art patience the only merit you allow me is unfortunately not one of the virtues of my character only it is true that i am loath to leave my work i consider it is never complete enough and in fear of leaving it too imperfect my conscience makes me think about it a long time and touch it up repeatedly it seems that my lace shocks you although i have painted none for fifteen years i vastly prefer scarfs which you sir would do well yourself to employ scarfs you may believe me are a boon to painters 
and had you used them you would have acquired good taste in draping in which you are deficient as for those stuffs those eloquent cushions those velvets to be seen in my shop it is my opinion that one should pay as much attention as possible to all such accessories on this point i have raphael as an authority who never neglected anything of this kind who wished everything to be explicit to be rendered minutely that is the language of art even to the smallest flowers in the grass i can furthermore quote the example of ancient sculpture in which not the most trifling accessories are found neglected the draped scarfs which lie so snugly upon nude figures and of which mere fragments are bought by real fanciers today the ornamentation on breastplates the buskins all that is carried out with perfect finish and now sir allow me to remark that the word shop which term you apply to my studio is scarcely worthy of an artist i show my pictures without having money asked at the door i have even to avoid that practice then in vogue among the painters of london set aside one day each week for persons of good standing and such persons as these may see fit to present to me i may therefore beg you to observe that the word shop is improper and that severity never excuses a man from being polite i have the honor to be etc this letter which i read to some friends remained no secret to london society and the laugh was not on the side of monsieur blank who all enmity aside did not know how to do drapings i met a number of compatriots in england whom i had known for years i had the felicity of meeting the comte d'artois once more at a party given by lady percival who received a number of exiles he had grown stouter and i really thought him very handsome a few days later he honored me by coming to see my studio i was out and i only returned just as he was going away but he was good enough to come back and compliment me upon my portrait of the prince of wales with which he seemed highly pleased the comte d'artois did not go out much into society having but a modest income he yet saved money with which he helped the poorest of the french his goodness of heart incited him to sacrifice all his pleasures for charitable purposes this prince's son the duke de berry often came to see me of a morning he sometimes appeared with small pictures under his arm which he had bought at a very low price what proves how good a judge of painting he was is that these pictures were splendid wovermans but it needed a very fine feeling to detect their merit under the grime that covered them the duke de berry also had a passion for music I was at the play in London when the murder of the Duke Denghein was announced. Hardly had the news spread through the theatre when all the women in the boxes turned their backs to the stage, and the piece would not have gone on if somebody had not come in to state the report a false one. We then all resumed our seats and the play continued, but as we went out it was, alas, all confirmed. We even learned some particulars of this atrocious crime which will always leave a terrible bloodstain on napoleon's career next day we attended the funeral mass celebrated for the noble victim all of the french our princes included and a large number of english ladies were present the abbe de bouvon gave a most touching discourse on the lot of the unhappy duke denghein the sermon ended with an invocation to the almighty to spare our dear princes from a like fate alas the prayer was not heard for we lived to see the duke de berry fall by the dagger of a dastardly assassin end of chapter sixteen recording by james k white chula vista